Hey, Raleigh. What's up, Nicole? What are you doing now that Climate Town is shut down forever? Well, I guess I'll go back to my true love of making billiard video. Wait a minute. What do you mean? I thought Climate Town was doing just fine. Have you seen this new movie, Climate, colon, the movie, parentheses, the cold truth, that totally disproves everything we thought we knew about climate change? Oh, my God. Raleigh, I've brought you here today to talk about a movie, a perfect movie, called Climate the Movie. I cannot wait to talk about this. I have a billion things to say, all positive. Yes, and first I'll say 10 stars out of five. Yeah, no notes on this movie. It was perfect. It was made by a guy named Martin Durkin, who oh. we've talked about on the podcast before. But this is his brand new movie. It's a sequel to one he made in 2007. And barely a sequel, more of a, a reboot. So we've both watched this movie, but for those of our listeners who haven't, and I hope it's all of you who haven't watched it. Uh, let's set the tone a little bit. Let's play a little bit of a clip so you get a sense of what we're talking about. Since the Industrial Revolution, the development of free market capitalist mass production has made ever more goods ever more affordable to ever larger numbers of people. Mass production marched hand in hand with mass consumption. In the modern age, ordinary people enjoy a level of prosperity never before achieved in human history. But all the while, we're told we were destroying the planet. Computers have calculated what is in store for us as we produce and consume ever more. The weather will get worse. The planet will boil. We greedy humans must accept limits on our lifestyle. Consume less, travel less. Those who deny the climate crisis are not just wrong, they're dangerous spreading the poison of doubt among a gullible population. These deniers should be shunned and shamed and censored. For these climate deniers are flat earthers. They are anti-science. Raleigh, can you tell us a little bit about what we just saw? Absolutely. Yeah, we just saw the intro to a tremendous film, but <laughs> it was all stock footage. Mm -hmm. All stock footage from the 1950s and earlier. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a... Nice looking piece, you know? It's like, that's how I would want to edit a video. To yeah, be it's it's a good aesthetic choice. Although if we want to make the point about like mass overconsumption, like you kind of fast forward to at least the 80s and 90s. Like, come on. Yeah, they were, I guess all the all the like people shopping were shopping in the 50s and we're like, yeah, that's kind of a quaint way to shop, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's also like hitting these re very real points with kind of like fake images behind them to make the points seem less realistic but it was a very accurate portrayal of what is happening currently yes exactly it does show that they've been listening they know exactly like what we're saying yeah um so it, it i suppose i have to give this documentary credit for being like well you at least have have listened to our arguments in some capacity yeah i love that it's it's taking climate change as it's well understood and happened and sort of making it seem so stupid it's like if they were like yes and humans were so obsessed with birds that they built big metal birds out of big metal cylinders and crammed <laughs> explosive devices into the back of them and then piled into these metal birds and blasted off into the sky that's what science is telling you is happening yeah they're saying a true thing sarcastically yeah, I guess it's a good way to set the tone for this movie, though, because it's like if you disagree with the first 30 seconds of the movie, you're probably not going to watch it. But if, if you're already like a denier and you just want a bunch of ammunition, you're going to that's that part's going to land just fine for you and you're going to watch the rest of it. Yeah. And we're talking about it because it came out this year. But also it's fun to see how sort of the same ish piece of media or a similar narrative has like transitioned from the 2007 version fast forward 17 years to 2024 and and what that looks like now a lot's changed in 17 years mm -hmm. it's really fun to see like what new crackpot theories <laughs> have bubbled up and it i was shocked to find that it was almost none it was all the old ones yeah it's very similar now for anybody who didn't listen to season one of the podcast we've already talked about this guy we talked about him in the it's the sun stupid episode he originally had a movie called the great global warming swindle that's right uh which you talked about great which, name yeah. swindle swindle 
you can't come back from that. <laughs> Swindler, <laughs> fuck, game over. It's like when Kendrick Lamar called Drake a pedophile. It's like, <laughs> what do you do? No, no, uh, you're done. You're cooked. Um, so for anybody who doesn't know, some people call Kendrick and Drake. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, some people call Martin Durkin the Michael Moore of the right. Who um, calls him that? A website I found. The Michael Moore of the right? Um, Michael Moore is a best-selling documentarian. Martin Durkin studied ancient and medieval history at the University College of London and economic history at the London School of Economics. Um, and he's produced several other things, both film and uh, on TV, the most famous of which was the Swindle movie. Um, and a lot of his projects have been largely critical of environmentalists. Cool. And lest you think his experience making all kinds of documentarish content uh, lends him any sort of, you know, authority on this subject, several scientists have claimed that he has misrepresented them and like cherry picked their arguments, um, including one guy, uh, Carl Wunsch. This is what he had to say about the great global warming swindle. We actually showed clips of the same Australian debunk of that movie in the It's the Sun Stupid episode, but this is one that we didn't cover before. In the original version joined those complaints, Carl Wunz, the professor of physical oceanography at Boston's MIT, claimed that he was the one who was swindled and that the filmmakers had misrepresented his views. Well, Professor Wunz says he clearly told them he believes global warming is real and a serious threat. He was cut out of the version you've just seen, along with other disputed elements. I think I nailed the pronunciation of that name. I, I was mean, a little off, but for having never heard it before, pretty good. I would say don't go off of what this guy says the pronunciation <laughs> is. He's In Australian. my experience, Australians and Brits do not give a fuck how a, a word is pronounced. <laughs> I I was studying abroad when Barack Obama was elected president, and my little like host brother was like, "So when what do you think of Barack Obama?" <laughs> And I was like, you must have heard it a hundred times. <laughs> Did it sound like that to you? They're, they do call tacos tacos. Yeah. And Nike is Nike. Yep. It's like put a little emphasis on Unacceptable. it. Unacceptable. They're allergic to seasoning, including over a letter. <laughs> Um, anyway, so that guy is just one of, of several scientists who've complained about their work being misrepresented by Martin Durkin. So this is the kind of guy who is very willing to, you know, take people out of context or twist their words to fit his agenda. Is it possible the scientists didn't know what they were saying? <laughs> I think it's unlikely. Um, but hey, you never know. Maybe they were in a fugue state. Is this the second time I've talked about fugue states? It's got to be the fortieth podcast. Really? You, yeah, you your so? eyes roll into the back of your head, and you Maybe just I'm like in a rip. Fugue state. Um, so that being said, he's already taken these scientists out of context before in his original movie. What? Why did he make another one? You know, what could he possibly have to add? Why would he? It, it wasn't his magnum opus completed? Didn't he debunk the climate scam completely? Look, when you're on top, you just got to do a little victory lap. Obviously, <laughs> he he destroyed climate change in 2007, and then he's like, I didn't do it enough. Scorched earth. I got to rebomb those villages. <laughs> He rebooted it. Everything's IP now, including climate denial. That's true. <laughs> he recast it. Yeah. He didn't recast it. It's a lot of the same guys. Um, but I can I can turn to an authority on the subject, mm. Martin Durkin himself. Oh. He did an interview to promote the movie on a podcast or YouTube show that I've never heard of. I'm seeing it's from British Thought Leaders, the YouTube channel. Yeah, British Thought Leaders. With 6.4 thousand subscribers. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know that I would call them leaders. Well, they're certainly not followers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's watch this clip right, of Martin Durkin explaining why he made this movie. All right. Yes, it's a climate skeptic film. Um, in fact, it aims to go further than being simply a climate skeptic film. It aims to knock the climate alarm on the head um, as far as as far as it possibly can um, and to arm the people who are sort of knock it on the head as far as it possibly can sure knock it on the head uh -huh. as far as it possibly can well you're knocking it on the head on the head maybe at an angle could be at an angle rolls off oh that's oh this is this is deep this is bars <laughs> It aims to knock the climate alarm on the head um, as far as as far as it possibly can um, and to arm the people who are sort of uh, intuitively skeptical but um, haven't sort of got the arguments to hand because they've been uh, deprived of them. 
arm the people who have feelings about it. <laughs> people feel like it's wrong. Yeah. And we want to confirm those feelings mm -hmm. by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. You know how facts are important? <laughs> Not as important as feelings, Nicole. Now, I will say... His mission statement is a little bit similar to the mission statement of this podcast. Which is what? Which is that we're- Get you know, rich yes. off of Soros money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is that not what you're trying to do? Uh, but it is to like- uh, you know, help clarify these really hard concepts to people who like sense intuitively that climate change is a big problem. Um, and the difference is that we're right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I honestly don't give a shit what people intuitively think going into this podcast. Yeah. I just want to tell them what the vast majority of competent scientists have discovered over the years. Yeah. And also do some fun little jokes on the way. <laughs> Um, haven't sort of got the arguments to hand because they've been uh, deprived of them by a rather sort of um, climate alarm orientated media. So that was the that was the purpose of the film. One small thing, orientated is a word that people can use. I can't criticize them for that because it's in the dictionary, but it drives me crazy because oriented is a word. That's true. Orientated. I mean, it feels very British. Yeah. It feels like they invented orienteering. Uh-huh. And then they have they can they can throw whatever suffix they want on it. I guess, man. But it's just we you orient yourself, mm -hmm. and then you're oriented. Also, like, is orient like that's the east, right? Yeah, it's you call Asia the Orient. I mean, you don't anymore. Please don't call it that. Anymore. I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, at one point, you the royal you call it that Got because it. It's, you, you're orientating yourself. I mean, do they call them oriental rugs? I'll tell you this right now. If the Brits call them oriental rugs, I will blow my brains out. <laughs> They've done enough damage to how things are pronounced. <laughs> and to the Orient, if we're being honest. <sighs> Can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so that's why he wanted to make it. Um, in terms of like how he was able to make it, the funding source isn't 100% clear. Um, I think it's pretty safe to say that like somebody like Exxon isn't funneling this guy a ton of money. Um, every source that I found said that this documentary had a pretty small budget. Having watched it, that doesn't surprise me. Um, our researcher, Knut, uh, said that he that he thinks the budget's about $100,000, so it could have been small donors or self-funded. 50000 of that has to be a Getty Image subscription. <laughs> There's a lot of B-roll in this. They were pulling from that subscription. <laughs> they must have gotten a bulk discount on that. Martin Durkin produced uh, the old movie through his production company called WAG, which sold to a French company called Asacha in 2021 as part of like an investment banking-style acquisition. So he may have had extra money from that um fun fact now wag is making content like ancient x files nasa's unexplained files and strange evidence which is a show about cctv that records supernatural phenomena honestly i love that <laughs> <laughs> more of that please yeah more of that less climate denial um so anyway the point is this is like not a big budget film it took like you know next to nothing in terms of like what features cost to make. Um, and I think that's reflected a little bit in the film quality. Some things are good and then some things are just weird. Like it looks weird. All the interviewees have like way too much headroom and they're looking a little too far off camera. And some of it is like, I think an artistic choice and some of it is just kind of lazy, I think. I think some some of it is a visual style that maybe British people prefer. I You know, I honestly don't know what like a British documentarian versus an American documentarian or, or as the Brits call them, documentatarians. <laughs> but I do know that there was at least one or two of the interviews that seemed very, like, self-taped. Yes. <laughs> out of focus. I've done this for Climate Town episodes. Uh -huh. so I, like, set up a DSLR, and I'm like, I, I use a broom to try to uh -huh. zoom in on the focus, and then I, like, sit where the broom was, and I'm yeah. like, I guess this is it. And then everything <laughs> is out of focus. That befell a couple of people in this video. Yeah, and there's a couple other like just sort of basic filmmaking things that are weird. Like the lower thirds that are supposed to like introduce each of the experts are really inconsistent. They mm. don't come up like on the first time the person's introduced and the title conventions aren't quite the same. And I don't I don't think that's like intentionally trying to mislead anybody as much as it is just like lazy filmmaking. Yeah, I guess if we're going to use the conventions of this documentary, it's all 
a plan, man, <laughs> to confuse <laughs> us that the government did. But um, yeah, I think it was mostly just uh, probably rearranging footage and post and yeah, maybe they had it burned onto the, the yeah, definitely pictures. possible. Um, yeah, so this movie is like it's low budget. It's not like super well made. It's not terrible. Yeah, look, I thought it looked fine. It looked fine. There's a lot of mostly little weird things. Fine. But it, it's like fine, but it's little. And, and so, like, why are we bothering to talk about it? You know? I mean, it was tweeted at me quite a lot of times <laughs> <laughs> from various people who are like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> I was like, oh, man, we're going to have to do this on the podcast. I mean, yes, that's funny. But that is kind of why we're doing it, because it is reaching people on the Internet. Um, It has less mainstream popularity than the previous movie, The Swindle, which was broadcast on Channel 4, which is like one of the main channels in the UK. Mm. Um, And according to one review, that first broadcast attracted a, quote, healthy 2.5 million viewers. And who knows how many sick ones? Um, (laughs) Cut cut that. (laughs) Jesus Christ. (laughs) <laughs> um, and so that was released on regular TV. This one was released straight to Vimeo, um, where it got like 60,000 views initially. Um, but still, there's like a lot of eyeballs on it. A conspiracy account reposted it to Twitter where it has over. <laughs> Wait, what? A, a conspiracy cons- account. Is it called a conspiracy no, account? No, I don't. It's there. It's, I'm not going to give them the traction. Gotcha. I, um, and I will note, we did not give them the traction. Because we just downloaded the MP4 file That's and then true. watched the MP4 <laughs> file separately. Um, a conspiracy account reposted it to Twitter and it has over 1.3 million views there. Wow. But also, I, I can't get a good sense of how accurate that is for an 80-minute documentary. Because you and I started doing comedy in the pivot to video era where Facebook was like totally lying about all of your video viewership numbers yeah so i don't know how many people made it through a substantial portion of it but let's assume all 1.3 million people are individual people who watched enough of it to now have some doubt about climate change um and then there's also over a million views on youtube uh on different there's like a bunch of different versions it's been Mm. reposted a few times um so it's tough to get exact viewing numbers but many many people have seen it online um, so even though this isn't getting like as wide a release as the original, it's still making sort of small-ish waves in online conspiracy communities where it's getting enough traction that I th- I think it's worth debunking. It's easy to write this stuff off, but in 2007, even though this kind of thing had more like mainstream, you know, backing behind it, it now has the ability to spread online in ways that just weren't around or at least weren't as convenient in 2007. You know, you're not watching an 80-minute documentary on YouTube in 2007. That's probably right, yeah. yeah. I mean, also, like, I don't know if this particular debunk is going to convince anybody who was tricked by it. But well, we got to put something on the Patreon, Raleigh. It's true. And it's also, this is this is fun for us. I don't know. Like, I see That's this. That's because you're chair two for this episode. Yeah, it was fun for me. <laughs> I, I see a documentary like this and I'm like, oh, God, the same stuff. Like, yeah. how are they gussying up this pig now? Yeah. Let's talk about how they are gussying up this pig. Now. Hey, it's a pig, but pigs deserve to be gussied up, too, Nicole. <laughs> Tonight, our specials are a gussied up pig. <laughs> oh, God. Uh- <laughs> Um, uh, So there's a couple disinformation techniques that they use throughout the documentary that we should talk about. One is one that you introduced me to on this podcast. I don't remember which episode. I think it was in the context of Vivek Ramaswamy. Uh, But it's a gish gallop. And I would sort of consider this whole thing to be a gish gallop, which is just sort of where they info dump Mm. everything on you. And you're like, well, wait, but what about this? But you made the argument. Hold, slow down. Uh, uh." And this that is like what this whole documentary felt like because there were so many arguments coming at you very fast with a lot of visual information on screen also did you feel that way i did feel that way i mean big caveat here this is not a debate it's a you know film so it's always going to feel like a very one-sided argument unless it's a really actually a good film that like actually takes into account (laughs) what other sides are thinking and genuinely positing instead of this like string of bullshit but yeah ultimately i think this is kind of meant to be a wave of overwhelming little tidbits that you don't have the time mentally to process how wrong and also 
contrary some of the points are to each other Mm -hmm. so in that way yeah it's a gish gallop where you just like try to overwhelm your opponent with as many things as you can think of with no regard to how true they are yeah totally and one big difference between this movie and the previous one is the fact that in 2024 the social media landscape the internet landscape has totally changed so people who believe this stuff can very easily clip this documentary down it's downloadable on vimeo um and post it to the platform of their choosing without any real like fact checking or or guarantee that any of this stuff is going to be true yeah and it looks pretty professional you know like They've got a good artistic tone. They've got graphs. They've got a lot of stock footage. Holy shit. Um, and, it, and it kind of feels like you could plop this into a, a Twitter thread and a, an observer might see this and feel as though this is from a very serious documentary that's got backup and sources when in fact it's from one that uh, I don't know that they did even one fact check. Yeah, and it's just a staggering number of arguments that they make in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, Professor Catherine Hayhoe, who's a who's a big mm. um, climate voice uh, on Twitter and like debunks a lot of stuff, um, tweeted: "There's a new climate denial movie doing the rounds. In the first 42 minutes, it manages to hit 25 common and long debunked myths about climate change. That may be a new record. That's a ton. And these are all assembled on um, skeptical science has done a a big breakdown of all of these." I'll show you the chart that they put together. This is like every single climate myth that is in this documentary. And it's even like coded with a number that corresponds to the page on their website that debunks it. Oh, yeah. Wow. Look at that. Yeah. CO2 is plant food. CO2 is just a trace gas. It's both plant food and it's also basically doesn't exist. It's so small. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's there's just so many, many of which we've talked about on the podcast. Yeah. Um, And I think the other thing that it really leans on throughout is this appeal to authority. Mm. There's all of these interviews with these mostly older white men. There's two women in it, very briefly. Um, Girl power. Nice. And for an example of what I'm talking about with this appeal to authority, uh, this is they do this a few times, but this is just one of the clips that I pulled. Teaching at New York University is one of these climate deniers. Professor Stephen Koonin is one of America's leading physicists. He was a science advisor to President Obama and both vice president and provost of Caltech, one of the most prestigious scientific institutes in the world. Wow. Yeah. That piano music you're hearing is not randomly inserted. No, it's diegetic. It's he's playing it. Yeah. The whole <laughs> this intro of this guy. Professor Ben it was surprised that I knew the word diegetic. <laughs> Professor, fuck. I'm calling you that. That's the second time I've done this. Ben was Ben knew it in his head, and he's like, please, Nicole, say this word. And then you said it, and then you got mad at him for being happy. <laughs> Which is, let that be a lesson to you, Professor Ben. Um, yeah, this is an amazing way to introduce somebody where they're like, yeah. they say climate deniers are stupid, but can stupid people play the piano? <laughs> I don't think so. I teach climate science to my students at NYU. Okay. Can we just, I love that phrasing. So we've just met this guy. Uh It's like Dr. Steve Coonan. Mm -hmm. Dr. Steve Coonan, one of the leading physicists, like advisor to Obama. We got to trust this guy. And then the way he drops into this, he's like, I teach climate science to my students at NYU. Mm Mm-hmm. I think the implication they're really trying to get us to think here is that this is a climate science teacher. He's, He's a, a physicist. physicist. And He's a physicist. And also, I lo- I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm an NYU alum, uh, and I looked him up, and he teaches at the Stern School of Business. You do your business! <laughs> is it's that a, how yeah, that's all of the classes are very stern you don't talk <laughs> you do the profits and not the losses um so yes he teaches at the stern school of business which later they talk about how like that too many disciplines are talking about climate change now which is like but you teach business <laughs> um, and which isn't to say he's never taught in a science department but he is specifically like being a little misleading about what 
and why for he's sure DJing. yeah i mean i just the phrasing of it like you're gonna clock this a million times if you ever watch this movie which fucking don't watch this by the way it's <laughs> bullshit but if you do it's all it's a it's a lot of little like ticky tack phrasing that's trying to get you to believe that these guys are climate scientists and geniuses and it's like what i think what you're gonna bring up later is that they are in fact not Climate scientist. Not only am I going to bring it up later, but later is now. Oh, <laughs> later is now and before is gone. Yes. Uh, Raleigh, with your permission, I'm going to do a little bit of a gish gallop at you to just kind of run through these guys as fast as possible. Um, so some of the, uh, you know, professors emeritus featured in this documentary are this guy, Steve Coonan. Uh, Dr. N- Steve Coonan. Dr. Steve Coonan, an okay. NYU professor, uh, theoretical physicist uh, with a PhD in physics from MIT. Sounds pretty credible. According to Naomi Oreskes uh, of Merchants of Doubt fame. Uh, he cherry picks and misrepresents outdated materials to downplay the seriousness of the climate crisis. Um, you're also going to see William Happer, a physicist and a, a professor at Princeton. According to Wikipedia, from 1991 to 1993, Happer served as the director of the Department of Energy's Office of Science as part of the George H.W. Bush administration. He was dismissed from the Department of Energy in 1993 by the Clinton administration after disagreements about the ozone hole. Huh. So he disagreed about the ozone hole, which I I would say environmentalists can point to as sort of their crowning achievement of the 90s is getting everybody to come together and close that thing. I mean, there's this amazing pattern that happened throughout history where like these physicists who worked on the atomic bomb got super famous, got promoted to like these crazy positions in government, and then immediately were just like, I think I'm the smartest man in the world. <laughs> I mean, I saved America with the bomb that I helped make. I think I'm a genius. Uh, now, not all of these people uh, worked on the bomb, but in addition to Coonan and Happer, we're also going to see Richard Lindzen, an atmospheric physicist, John Clauser, a Nobel winning physicist, Willie Soon, an astrophysicist, Sally Baliunas, an astrophysicist. It is a pattern where so much of it is, is physicists that I tweeted about it and I was like, does anybody know why it seems to be like so many of the climate denying scientists are physicists? And I got some answers that I... I would love to read to you. Please. Um, Reading my... tweets on a podcast? <laughs> Hell yes. Could you imagine? Uh, my friend Josh Frulinger runs a very fun show in Los Angeles called The Internet Read Aloud, which is wow. makes sense because we're reading tweets aloud. Uh, he tweeted, uh, physicists believe that they are uniquely equipped to reason out everything about the universe from first principles. My friend Emma Phipps tweeted, generalizing a lot here, but classical physics is very formulaic and reductionist, inputs and outputs. It's also very hard. So people who excel at it may be prone to thinking of themselves as smarter than other, quote, softer scientists, which I thought was pretty insightful. Um, Somebody I don't know named Cameron Fredman or Cameron Friedman uh, tweeted this, (laughs) which made me laugh. He said, I have a solution to inadequate action on climate change, but it only works on spherical politicians in a vacuum. Nice. (laughs) That's a fun bit. And then somebody named Kevin Marks tweeted this Saturday morning breakfast cereal cartoon at me, which is from 2012. So this has been an observed phenomenon happening for a while. Uh, Raleigh, will you do the honors of of describing this? Sure. All right. So um, it's a couple of people who are bringing like a... A little white-haired physicist in a little dog crate container to their vet. And they, and they say, Doctor, we have this pet physicist and something's wrong. It keeps babbling about linguistics and neurology and climate science. Then the vet looks and he's like, he's a little old, isn't he? How did you know? Well, the physicist has a natural life cycle. Juvenile physicists mostly roll around in books. Once they reach maturity, they are productive and fun. But, well, as they get on in the years, they reach the telling other fields they're wrong about everything phase. There's nothing you can do. I'm afraid it's really best to put him down. Oh, gosh. I Oh, God. oh no. Think it over. Remember, he's suffering inside, too. And then the couple embraces, and they're kind of sad. Where are you going, honey? I just want a few last moments with the old guy. And then... We had a lot of good times, boy. And then the one line the physicist gets, which is a little rude to physicists, but here it is. Climate models aren't reductionist enough. We can recreate the first language using statistics. I know, buddy. I know. <laughs> really good reading, Raleigh. Thank really you good. very much. Um, yeah, so so it does seem like a, like... I don't know. It's one of those things where, sure, you can appeal to authority. I'm not doubting that these guys are very good physicists, but just because you're good at physics doesn't mean you know a lot about another specialized field. And, that you know, that's not even like, I don't even think there's any ill will 
there. I think it is just like when you're good at something, you think maybe you'll be good at other stuff. Like Ben Carson is famously like a brilliant neurosurgeon Gifted and hands. one of the dumbest people <laughs> to ever work in public service. Yeah, I, and I, I mean, also like these guys seem pretty smart. I mean, that guy played the fucking piano, Nicole. <laughs> Could these a guys, dumb guy do that? These guys do seem smart, but I, I, I gotta imagine if I'm trying to break into their psychology, it's like you've been smart your whole life, you've been doing a bunch of physics your whole life, and then when somebody is like, "Hey, there's a huge problem," you're like, "Oh well, I bet it's not that big of a problem." Yeah, and then reinforcing this idea that you've already kind of generated. You just like find all this data that fits with the assumption you already had Mm -hmm. and you ignore all the other shit, Mm -hmm. even when it's been debunked for decades. (laughs) And then you get a documentary like this. And by the way, I'm sure there are lots of physicists out there who are like, climate change is real. Like climate change is real and a problem. We should act on it. So uh, this is not uh, not all physicists, you know, Mm. hashtag not all physicists. Wow. Get it trending. (laughs) Um. So those are the guys that we're seeing, but let's talk about what we're hearing them say. Okay. And it's weirdly like all kind of outdated stuff. It doesn't feel like the way that even climate deniers talk about climate change anymore. Like, like even like Exxon Mobil now is like climate change is happening, but you need oil as a bridge fuel or Mm. we'll do direct air capture or whatever. And these guys are really hanging on to there is no climate change. Which just feels so old fashioned. I guess, yeah, because it's been debunked for years. Yeah. It's it's it is strange to see these arguments come up again and just like know the answers to all of them. Yeah, and that's why Skeptical Science was able to put together that big chart, which we will link in the show notes. Um, it's and- like when Drake released Family Matters and uh-huh. then Kendrick released Meet the Grams like fifteen minutes later yeah. or something. Yeah, because Skeptical Science was able to just like drop this giant debunk because they'd already done it. Yeah. They already did this research. Right, exactly. Um, Just a quick rundown of some of their arguments. The documentary claims that the medieval warm period was warmer than it is now. False globally average temperature is higher than in medieval times. Uh, They claim in the 70s they said there'd be an ice age. False. The vast majority of climate papers in the 1970s predicted warming. We talked about that in Mm. the uh, It's Global Cooling episode. Yeah. Um, uh, They claim it's the sun stupid, which is the title of one of our episodes. False. In the last 35 years of global warming, solar activity and global temperature have been going in opposite directions. They claim CO2 is plant food. We have an episode about that. The effects of enhanced CO2 on terrestrial plants are variable and complex and dependent on numerous factors. Yeah. And I guess I guess not to push back, but to like clarify, a lot of these points are not false on their face. They're like there's a piece of them that's true. Mm -hmm. Like the Milankovitch cycles are important in Mm -hmm. the average temperature of the earth. And there's a piece of them that's true. Like, yes, plants do need CO2 to thrive. But then they take that little piece Mm -hmm. and then they stretch it out over this like giant argument that it does not actually contain. Yeah. It's false by over extrapolation. Like, yes, the sun impacts the Earth's temperature. Mm -hmm. But when they say the only thing that impacts the Earth temperature is the sun, therefore man caused climate change cannot be true. Like that's using a thing that's true to make a false statement. Yeah. And that in that way, yes, all those all these arguments are false arguments. Yeah, exactly. Um, And again, a lot of these are things that came up in the great global warming swindle and were debunked. And and can you believe he's doing the thing with the graphs again? You know what this is, I think? What? This is like Taylor's version. (laughs) (laughs) And so if you're not familiar... Taylor Swift recorded a bunch of songs, but didn't own the master copy of the song. And so a few years later, she re-recorded all of those songs and called it Taylor's version. Mm-hmm. And now she can like release all those songs. Mm-hmm. It's like Martin Durkin somehow didn't have the copyright on the great global warming <laughs> swindle. and was like, I'm going to make Martin's version. And this is it. And that's the end of the preview. Thanks for listening. If you want to hear the whole episode, head on over to our Patreon page where we got the whole thing ad free. Now, do not worry. We got a bunch of episodes right here for free. But if you want to support the show and hear us cracking wise about other people's mamas, the Patreon page is the place to do it. I hope to see you there. But obviously, you know, you do you. Bye. Bye.